poverty, property, asset, education, and then of course employment. I just want to give the figure uh, for all India and we have a national sample survey around and I have the data for 2011 and 12. And in rural area, you have four occupational groups. One is the landowner, farmer, we have some asset. Second is we have private enterprise and business. So in the ownership of private asset, land and non-land, two categories, and other is the casual labor, farm and non-farm. Whose main source of income is working on the farm or working on the non-farm. There is a third category also which has come, that is regular salary, teachers, clerk, in co-operative society. And you get a percentage share among each of the communities. Now I just want to quickly give it to you that in 2011, after 60 years of private property or 200 years of private property being uh, right to private property and business being made equal, regularly, this is the situation, the historical consequences of denial of economic right to right. The proportion of the farmer whose main source of income is farming is 52% in Karnataka. I'm giving Karnataka 52% at state level. 62% for the others, that is excluding Shadrukha, Shadrukha, and OBC. 62% of them are farmed. For others, as well as OBC, Karnataka is a critical case. You may have a much less other than the OBC perhaps. So 61 to 62 percent of the household in rural India are farmers. They are asset. This proportion is 50 percent above the tribal. Of the total tribal household in rural India, 50 percent have land. How big is the land? Small land? That's another question. The proportion of shared class is only 24 percent in Karnataka. Three times less than that of OBC and others. How do you explain that? You can explain because of those historical denial of property right to the share. Tribal will not deny, that's why their proportion is 50 percent. Business and private production, non farm production. At the table, only we are allowed to uh, start production or produce something in a polluting, so called polluting occupation leather, sanitation, rope, and other. The proportion of those who are engaged in non-farm production in rural area is almost 18 percent rural area for others, 13 percent for OBC, but only 8 percent for shadow class and 5 percent for shadow class. So neither they own farming land nor they own private enterprises. As a result, there is heavy dependency on casual labor. So the proportion of casual labor in Karnataka is the following. More about 34 percent of the household in rural area, rural Karnataka, are whose main source of income is wage labor, 34 percent. Only 18 percent among others, 27 percent for OBC, 41 percent for Shadow Tribe, but whooping is 68 percent for Shadow Because the ownership of land and private enterprise is much less. Same with the story in urban Karnataka. Karnataka story is not different from that of all India story. <coughs> Margaret told me that if I can quote all India story. The proportion of farmer at all India level is 54% average, 63% for other, 58% for OPC. No, sorry. The proportion of farmer is 56% for all India level, 63% for others, 58% for OBC, 54% for driver, but only 37% for national So where do you go? You go to your all India, Karnataka, pick up any state. I have done, uh, I, I hope you have read that book, uh, Dalit in India. So any, any way you go. So the consequences of denial of right to property coming through the channel of caste and not through capitalism and feudalism. The one more figure I would like to that 
that is ownership of private enterprise. See, uh, you may be familiar that there is advertisement of national sample, uh, about national sample uh, survey economic census. This is the census of the industries. <laughs> Gentlemen come and test that the NSS man will come and go and kindly give the information. This is a census, economic census of industries that we own. How so sir? And that's very authentic. I have a statistic for Karnataka that of the total household, those who own production, private production, other than agriculture, and businesses production, private enterprises, 90% are owned by OBC and others. 47% by OBC, 42% by others. But only 6.3% by scheduled cars and 4% by tribe. While the population of the world is scheduled class is, uh, is, is I am told, 80% or so in Karnataka. As against the population of 18%, the share in the private enterprise is only 63%. Several, several times less than the OTC analysis. That is because historical consequences of denial for the ownership of private enterprises. Same is the story at all India level. But the share of the OBC and others is OBC is 46%, others is 37%. Share of is 11%, again the population share of 16, private is only 5%. I would not like to go into education because that was another idea. The endowment rate, I am really shocked that the endowment rate in Karnataka, which is otherwise very well developed in education, higher education, the endowment rate is much less compared to ST, compared to OBCL. So, the three areas where the caste has put restrictions for hundreds of years on scheduled caste, their consequences even today are very, very clear in terms of disparities in ownership of asset and access to it. As a result, thanks to Madheshwaran that he has given me the latest figure on poverty. All these backwardness of lack of access to asset, lack of access to employment, I am not giving employment figure, is then ultimately reflected in income and poverty. The estimate of Madheshwaran for 2011 and 12 for the poverty for Karnataka, I am giving you first and then at all India. Is that in rural area the poverty ratio is 24%? This is the poverty line, not Lakatwala. Okay, Lakatwala led to a lot of contracts now. Planning Commission has accepted them, which increased the poverty rate. So, about one fourth of the people in Karnataka are poor. Others 21% and OBC 21%. Similarly, 21% of other OBC are poor. 32% tribal and 37% of shared class. Highest poverty among the scheduled class in country. The reason I have to do. Same is the story in urban area. In urban area, tribal are more poor than the scheduled class. The scheduled class are much more poor than the OBC and the others. Let me finish this statistical account. Now let us come to the private sector. Now when we are talking of ownership of land and ownership of private enterprise, we are talking of private sector. We are not talking of government sector. Ownership of agricultural land is a private ownership of land. Ownership of enterprise, we are talking of private enterprise. Now, in this respect, you can very easily see now, why do you need special protection or reservation of the action policy for agriculture or discriminatory? Untouchable. Tribal, we have added to that because of civil deprivation and isolation, physical. but we added women then later on. Women also suffer discrimination. I was chairman of the University Land Commission for five years and I visited three universities which has completed 150 years. They celebrated and I went there. In all the three universities, the first thing that my chancellor had, had done was to show me the first woman student in their university, which was somewhere around 18. 1870 or 18. Because women did not have right to education. Similar to that of the Hindu. So the first photograph. And immediately those women were partial. So discrimination is not suffered by the little alone, but also women in certain areas. The Brahmin women do not suffer the discrimination on account of nature. But Brahmin women do suffer on account of patriarchy. And the 
seven ladies of women in the monastery. Now, the issue that I want to take is the privacy. First, <coughs> let me go to the how, how is it that uh, how is it that there is a separate policy for the excluded and discriminated group in many countries in the world. The reason is the following, and in the background of what I have said, it will be made clear to you that the difference between the excluded poor, excluded communities, it may be African American and uh, Hipsani, Hipsani uh, the, those who come from other nationalities in USA or women in USA or protesters in Northern India or Negro or African black people in South Africa or Burak women in Japan or 56 minority in China ethnic and religious minority and several indigenous groups in Asia the world bank put them together into two worlds excluded community and indigenous community in our country excluded would be essentially buried and indigenous would be similar to that of tribe discrimination will include even women so you have the excluded communities and you have non-excluded communities but if you focus on the poor belonging to excluded and non-excluded poor why is it that for the poor from non-excluded communities there is a one policy certainly that is the uh, policy of anti-poverty program social protection program distribution of land public education and all that this is a common policy for which is made for everybody you find that everybody will be everywhere. but there is an additional supplementary or complementary policy which is made in addition to the general policy uh, of empowerment economic and educational empowerment there is an additional policy from the discriminated group of uh, in various countries and that is called it is called by various names it is called affirmative action policy in USA it is called equal opportunity policy in Northern Ireland it is called special measure in Japan it is called new policy in Malaysia we get confused between the word affirmative action and reservation and the academician picked up reservation and pitch against the affirmative action without understanding that all are same these are the different names we have the similar problem I'll cover that now why is it that this additional and add-on policy is made for the poor belonging to the excluded community in addition to the common policy for all the poor we have that policy in India we have Narega which is applicable to everybody we have land distribution policy which is uh, uh, applicable to everybody we have policies uh, similar policy in health scheme but additionally we say that we have policy for shadow caste, Thai, woman, now or mostly and similar to physical handicap because the reason is that the sources of deprivation of discriminated communities is through the channel of exclusion and discrimination which is not the case of high non excluded poor and the, because of that channel you have to address this to put it in a simple word all over the world and here in India we recognize that this untouchable community particularly with which the reservation began in 1932 in Puna political reservation in 40s it was extended to education and employment and later on to the settled tribe. The basic argument was based on the architecture of the So the argument for affirmative action policy of giving preference for reservation is that they are denied an equal rights even today. Under the law of the land everybody has an equal right. But untouchable set are denied those rights which others enjoy. The non-excluded poor also enjoy. Non-excluded proletariat also enjoy. But the excluded proletariat do not. So in addition to the general problem from which non-excluded poor suffer, in addition to that, the excluded poor also suffer similar to that of non-excluded poor, but additionally discrimination in multiple sphere of life including the economic sphere, including the private sphere. And therefore, there is a case for providing a safeguard against discrimination. That's why law of undefinable comes. That's why law of atrocity comes. That's why reservation comes. That in a normal course, the untouchable, even if he is educated, he may likely to face discrimination as against the other person. Therefore, we have to give him some preference. 
give the subject to the narrator. Now this is the ideology of philosophy of reservation in the Now there are three various arguments we are making the debate and I will take a couple of arguments before I go to the private sector. When this argument was put before the private sector, they are arguing two, three, four. Please understand carefully because it's going to come. You are going to face with that argument when you put this thing on your election. Number one, private sector denies that there is a discrimination in hiring. Private sector says that we respect merit and efficiency because we want to earn profit. So there is no discrimination. And the very basis of discrimination, very basis of reservation policy is discrimination. If there is no discrimination, then the poor from excluded group are not different from the poor from non excluded group. Then you don't require affirmative action policy. Then you don't require special support to the untouchable. The case for support, for a special support, is based on the ground that they suffer from discrimination. If they don't, they don't require. Then they are like any other poor, landless, assetless, deseducated. Then the general economic policy will be good enough for them also. But the basis for reservation or any special preference is discrimination. And it is here that the private sector was arguing that we don't discriminate, we, is, we only hire labor on the basis of merit and efficiency. And therefore, if you look at that book, there are there is a special sec section on merit and others. That is one argument. The second argument is. <coughs> Uh, the second argument is that employment is reduced. It is the high caste which are higher, high caste poor which are higher. In the restaurant, you have to see, untouchable in the village restaurant are not higher to serve. They are higher to clean the place at the most, but they are not higher into, into serving. Discrimination in employment. Urban area, there are studies, Madhishwaram will share with you, but I want to give one study, which we did, and if we can, we can study. That study is, it's called correspondence study. My institute responds to the advertisement by the private corporate sector. For the whole one year, we send the application in response to the advertisement. Various days, Hindu, Times of India, and others. Four categories of application were made. One Dalit, one Muslim, one high caste. And fourth category was higher, highly educated shadow caste but low educated parents. But all categories of four categories of application were sent with equal qualification. No difference whatsoever. What was the reason for call-up interview? The Dalit has a 65% less probability of getting interview call with equal qualification compared to the others, high caste. The Muslim has 35% less probability of getting an interview call, despite the fact that they have the same qualification. What, is, what was surprising, that, that the Shadu caste who is highly qualified than the others, who is MA than the others, others will be a, had a low probability of calling for interview. That showed the discrimination at the level of the staying itself. There are other studies which show that uh, there, is, there are elements of discrimination. Now, this discrimination is not made by high class, poor high class worker. Remember me. that is the difference. Between. And therefore, you have to provide some protection to the shelter class worker who face discrimination. And what is that? That is the reservation that we will give you. All meritorious shelter class will give you as per your population share. That is the same kind of discrimination which the high class poor do not require. Of course, high class poor also face the discrimination associated with powerlessness and corruption. I am not saying that. But as far as the caste is concerned, they are immune from the caste. That is the first argument I will say. It's another point I will make about the employment and it came for a discussion. The process of recruitment should be equal and equality. I want to clearly say before this audience, the transparent and open process of recruitment provides justice. <coughs> Dr. Ambedkar was the first in this country. His contribution is forgotten by many people as a labor minister in, 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 in 
in, in British period, he was the Labour Minister. He included the concept of employment exchange in Calcutta. Employment exchange are fair. You put your name and buy data, and the others are required to call, uh, get the application from them. Advertising in newspaper, transparency. Anybody can apply and get advertised out. But now three new methods have come. Please remember well. One is the on-campus recruitment, second is the website, third is the agency. All of these are in a egalitarian, non-transparent method where the identity of the person, caste, religion, religion come into play. And private sector would say that we have taken candidates from the best of the campuses. But how do they know that there is other campuses where there are better students? It's likely to be better student in other campuses also. So you are not respecting many efficiency. You are going for your cost saving because if going to one campus, you immediately get a student. So I think this argument was made clear. Let me take a second argument very quickly because I am taking too much of time. That is, that general policy is important. Let there be a policy based on backwardness, economic backwardness. So anti poverty. Now this argument has also a fallacy. Let me give you an example. You provide an education to everybody. A high class poor, high class poor, poor person became a graduate, a low class poor person became a graduate, both entered into the labor market. Our study showed that the low class, their teachers had a less probability area of getting interview uh, uh, and getting appointed with same qualification compared to the poor from the So the education enabled them to apply for a job, but after having applied, the class that not come into play. The shared class person is in a disadvantaged position, these are the non shared class. So education, uh, policy of education development is necessary for all. But the shared class will require additional policy. As a safeguard against discrimination in the market. That is reservation, that is the community action policy. So how do you say that one policy of Education development is good enough for children class and children child. That's incorrect. You do require a public education system to get education to everybody, but for children class additionally, after having given education to them, they require protection against discrimination in the market. And therefore, you want to have some sort of a policy. You call it the affirmative action policy, you call it the reservation, whatever. But the purpose is to give a fair share to the children class. Our academics should keep on playing with the world. Reservation and affirmative action, quota and non quota. That is not the issue. Issue is the schedule class face discrimination, so you devise a method whereby they get a fair share. That is the key thing. You call it whatever you may like to call it. So the general policy will not help. You require general policy for the poor, but added and supplementary and complementary policy for the discriminated. This is the argument that, that is there. Now, I, I, I don't want to take other argument of the private sector, but I will submit to you that that there are other areas where there is a lot of discrimination. I don't want to uh, say that. Not for grocery growth aid. Nobody buys milk from the shelter class. Nobody goes to the uh, grocery shop of the shelter class. Even if you start a shop, only shelter class will buy. Income is low, demand is less, income is low, and you run into close up the shop. This is not the problem of poor, uh, poor, uh, uh, high caste. Everybody will go to the shop of the poor. Everybody will buy meat from the uh, high caste. So the discrimination in the market faced by the producer also create a problem. The Marxists will have to look at the economics of caste system a lot more clearly. Now the right wing economists have brought out a book. Akilot has brought out a book. Identity economics. That how your identity has affect the economic outcome. We need the theory also that how with the economic motive you dis discriminate and how does it affect the discrimination. So I think the what is required is the recognition that there is a discrimination that exists in the private sector, in agriculture, non-agriculture, in hiring, in land, in many other. The shelter class farmers do not get services of private two-way education. They hardly get a factor, even if they get there, give a higher price. So discrimination is not confined to your employment market, it covers every sphere of markets. Finance, credit, input, sale of products. 
So you define a comprehensive policy for the private sector, not only for employment. Please remember where the schedule class has discrimination in all the schemes. Including the government scheme, we have done a study for seven states and the discrimination faced by the Dalit woman is there. That they are not employed in a midday meal scheme. They are not employed in Anganwadi as a cook, cook in a midday meal scheme. I as an economist look for the economic consequences. There are 55,000 midday meal in Rajasthan. And each midday meal employed to cook and help her. It means 120 employees. John Grace studies bring out that in 60% of the midday meal, the people are not employed, the little people are not there. So forget about dignity, the consequences of employment are huge because of class discrimination in employment. Economics, forget about social. Now left economics and academician has to realize this, that how does the class, economics of class, affect the economic condition of the same class, affect the employment, affect the income of the farmer, affect the income of the uh, producer, affect the business. That their demand is confined to the people of their own caste. I went to Haryana, Valmiki woman where they have cow and money to start vegetable. Nobody buys, even, even the, some of the higher Shadrukas do not buy from Valmiki woman. And as a result, their vegetable shops is closed, they, they sold their buffet because there is no uh, demand for meat. The Jat opposed purchasing of Valmiki's meat in a cooperative society. They say if you buy from the Valmikis, we will not save you the world. Please understand the economics of caste system and then it will, will give you a reason as to why their poverty could remain high, why their poverty reduced at a lower rate. The, let me put in a fresh, fresh form, discrimination induced, social exclusion induced economic deprivation of wealth is an issue which needs to be understood. I think these are some of the points that I want to share with you. I am not touch upon the policy uh, because time is a constraint. We can talk about the policy later on, but I think uh, the discriminatory working of the economy, private economy, and not only employment, many need to be addressed properly. But thank you very much. I have taken too much of time. I have talked to